And this is a joint work that was done with Charmil Hong and Sandra Srinivasan. And this was done when Charmil was, Charmgil was an intern with us at Robert Bosch. So uh, the topic of my talk, as uh, Pala pointed out, was dealing with class imbalance using thresholding. And just like uh, Dr. Schneider's talk, the problem that we faced came out from a real life application. And the application that I'm talking about is crab detection in manufacturing production lines. So I guess most of you know what a production line is, but just to be clear, I want to explain that again. When we speak about a production line, it's basically an assembly line where a part is being manufactured. By a part, what I mean is an instance of a product. Let us take a laptop, for example, and so you might have different stations. In station number one, there might be uh, the screen that is being attached to, say, the, uh, the, monit the monitor is being attached to the keyboard. In station number two, the CPU is being put inside and so on. And finally, the final product of the laptop is coming out. And once, so this is the assembly line. And once things come out of the assembly line, you have a testing line where you test the quality of the product. And parts or the instances of the product being manufactured are labeled as good or scrap based on the quality test and the end of line. If it fails the quality test, it's called scrap, otherwise it's called a good part. So this was a real life use case, and what we wanted to do is scrap detection in these manufacturing production lines. So once we translate it into um, uh, a classification problem or a machine learning problem, the problem that we wanted to solve was given the features of the parts, how to detect whether they are good or bad. And the classical approach would, of course, be binary classification. But the problem with binary, so here what we had for in the binary classification problem, we had the dominant good parts and the outlying scraps. So the scraps, uh, scraps was something like an outlier because we had very few scraps out there. And the challenge was that, uh, as I said, the scrap was an outlier, and the quality distribution of the parts, which ultimately told us whether the part is a good or a bad part, it's, it's a highly skewed data set, so it was highly imbalanced. And I'm speaking of a particular use case from manufacturing, but it's not just true in manufacturing. Take medical diagnosis, network intrusion, fraud detection, and so on. In all these scenarios, you have cases where you have two different kinds of uh, labor and one of them is highly skewed. And this is the kind of problem that we wanted to solve. So uh, why can't we just use a traditional uh, binary classification method? And the reason being that the inherent assumption in most of these traditional methods is that the underlying class distribution is balanced. And due to the imbalance of scrap, the model may not be trained properly. Even worse, the model may become trivial because everything can be predicted as the good part for our uh, particular manufacturing example. So how do we deal with this problem? We dealt with this problem by uh, creating a novel method dealing with class imbalance using thresholding. What do I mean with that, by that? I'll come in, in the next slide. But what, what it basically helped us to do is that if the class with fewer instances or outliers, a solution um, enabled us to detect these outliers or the rarer class. So I think the concept of thresholding is very intuitive, but for the sake of clarification, I'll just define it. Uh, for a tunable parameter alpha, For a tunable parameter, sorry, alpha we have, and a threshold alpha star, alpha star is a maximum value wherein, uh, for alpha wherein a decision choice is satisfied. And a proper, a proper uh, choice of alpha star enables us to take actionable insights. So taking an example of a linear classifier, say the linear classifier outputs a real valued prediction alpha for each instance. The threshold alpha star gives us a decision boundary. So if alpha is more than alpha star, we have a predicted class one, and if alpha is less than alpha star, then the predicted class is zero. 
So our contributions was formalizing this concept of thresholding and we had a novel perspective to classification using this umbrella framework and we addressed class imbalance both in linear and nonlinear classification. In linear classification, we provided a principled approach for choosing the threshold and uh, we did and this threshold was dependent upon the class imbalance. And for nonlinear classifiers, we, we had a linear entropy-based novel method for thresholding for decision trees. Dr. Schneider spoke about Renier uh, distributions and speaking about Renier entropy. So Renier is like a current recurrent theme. So what do we mean by adaptive Renier decision trees? Uh, so I'll describe the method later, but the basic intuition out here is a decision tree learning which is more robust to class imbalance. And I'll show you or I'll give you an intuition of why it's more robust to uh, class imbalance. Uh, I think this slide is almost redundant, but just for the sake of uh, completion, I'm putting it here. What, what happens in a, in a decision tree is you basically select you basically select the best splitting uh, condition D according to the splitting criterion. Taking an example from manufacturing, say you have pressure and flow. These are the two features that determine whether a part is good or bad. You then determine uh, the best splitting condition, uh, whether flow will give you the best feature, uh, splitting condition or pressure will give you the best splitting condition. You decide that. Say for, for us, uh, pressure gives us the best splitting uh, condition. So we see that if pressure is more than 6.5, that's the first branch that we have. And then we see in what condition flow, uh, what is the condition for flow? that gives us a best splitting criterion and we say if flow is uh, more than 15.5 and if pressure is less than 6.5 then pass us crap. So this is a process that continues and as we all know in the decision tree learning. So uh, uh, what, what is the contribution that we make? The contribution that we make is, is in defining the splitting criterion. Uh, the typical splitting criterion that we often use is information gain, which is based upon Shannon entropy, right? So Shannon entropy, uh, you basically have the distribution of the prior class here, and you have the expected Shannon entropy, and you have the difference between uh, the Shannon of the uh, prior class and then uh, if you divide it into distribute it based upon the feature. Now, if you see the expected Shannon entropy, even that depends upon the prior distribution, and you can sh show that by simple Bayes theorem. And uh, what, uh, what information gain does is it measures the impurity of a subset of data, and it helps us to identify the best, splitting, uh, best decision split by minimizing the expected Shannon entropy. But as I said, it depends upon the, uh, the class proportions because it depends upon the, pl uh, the prior class uh, distributions. And this is, this is what basically creates the bias. The class proportion influences the Shannon entropy. And the, if, when the data is imbalanced, this may confuse the learning process and result in trees that are more biased towards majority class. So how do we deal with it? We deal with it using the Renier entropy. And uh, the basic intuition behind this is the, is the presence of this tunable parameter alpha in Renier entropy, which helps us to mitigate the effect of the, uh, the imbalance of classes. And uh, we develop a splitting criterion that adjusts the underlying, uh, underlying distribution, class distribution, using Renier entropy. And this parameter alpha then is determines the operating characteristics. And please note that Shannon entropy is a special case of the Renier entropy when alpha tends to 1. And also I would like to emphasize out here when alpha tends to 1, basically what you have in Renier entropy is Shannon entropy. And that in the ideal scenario when the classes are balanced, it, it works perfectly. So uh, going to adaptive Renier entropy, what we then do is we uh, determine the best split by minimizing the expected Renier entropy. And we apply the idea of thresholding. So what we do is let uh, P L of Y subscript uh, L Y denote the class distribution uh, of a node L. Then we find an alpha star, which is a tunable parameter alpha, which is a maximum alpha, where this condition is satisfied. That is, the Renier entropy is 1. That's uh, the maximum value of alpha where the Renier entropy is 1. And then we select the best splitting criteria that maximizes this Renier entropy. And after that, if you see the steps, the splitting criterion is very similar to any decision tree, that, uh, decision tree algorithm. 
So now I go to some experiments that we had. Uh, the first experiment that we had was with benchmark evaluation and here what we did is that we had 18 public data sets. These were like the standard data sets that are used. For example, the data that's obtained from UCI and the Mulan data repositories. And it included data from various domains, including audio, image, uh, chemistry, biology, medical, and so on. And the evaluation metrics that we used was F1 score and accuracy. So we compared different methods. We compared linear regression, linear regression with cost-sensitive approach, linear regression with undersampling, oversampling, logistic regression, logistic regression with cost-sensitive approach, and so on. We also used, uh, we compared many decision tree variants, including the standard decision tree, uh, the DKM-based decision tree, the Hellinger distance-based decision tree, and symbol alpha decision tree, and of course, our method, which we are calling adaptive linear decision tree. And surprise, surprise, of course, our method performs one of the, is significantly better than most of the methods. And it shows that decision trees in general perform better than others. I would also like to emphasize why did we focus so much on decision trees? As I said, this is a real life problem that we are working with. And uh, the people who are, we are working with are people from the manufacturing lines. And they really emphasize an interpretability. And that's the beauty of decision trees. When we're giving them some solution, they kind of understand those solutions and they are more meaningful for them. So that is one. Uh, point I wanted to bring across. The second point that I wanted to bring across was uh, the accuracy. Even if the accuracy improves slightly, that's of great advantage because we were talking about the false positives and the false negatives, and that's a huge issue out here because if you're sending out a bad part into the market, that leads to warranty claims and a lot of problems can occur because of that. So even a slight, uh, imp uh, slight uh, increase in accuracy is very advantageous. So let's go to the application in manufacturing. Uh, so as I said, uh, each, each line consists of multiple stations with different operations. And at each station, several measurements of the product are taken. And at the end of the line, we have a series of special testings that inspect the quality of the finished product. So the data set that we had, it consists of 16 factors of variables for 5,000 parts. And the measurements of, from the assembly lines and the end of line tests were taken as features. And the daily scrap rate, that is the, the parts that were tested as bad depended was from 6 to 16 percent. Again, the evaluation scores that we had was F1 score and accuracy, and the methods that we compared here were mostly the decision-based tree and decision tree-based me methods and the variants. And again, uh, our method uh, showed significant, it performed better than most of the other methods, and the results that we show here is based upon tenfold cross-validation. So to conclude, uh, we formalized the concept of thresholding. We had an umbrella framework to address the class imbalance problem, and we showed the relationship between a threshold and an underlying class distribution. And we provided a principal approach for selection of threshold in linear classification. Due to lack of time, I did not go into it, and I'll be happy to discuss it with anybody who's interested. And uh, we also proposed a novel decision tree learning method to deal with class imbalance, which was based upon Renier entropy. And we have demonstrated its usefulness in in a real life manufacturing data. Thank you. That's it. Thank you for the great talk, Rumi. Um, questions? I think these are not questions of comments that were class imbalance. We don't use accuracy as a performance measure. I've worked in that area for many years. And uh, that's one thing. And second thing, also thresholding is not a new concept. That I've seen that before. So these are two comments. Uh, definitely, uh, when we are talking about accuracy, we were talking about accuracy of the when you have the particular scrap, we see uh, accuracy for that particular um, class. And that is what the measure that was a KPI that these people were themselves using. So that is what we had used out there. And uh, uh, the concept of thresholding, of course, is not new. But what we were proposing out here is based upon decision trees and the idea of how you tune the decision trees based upon alpha, like the Renier entropy tunable parameter. Questions? Thank you for your talk. Uh, any classical regression uh, classification tree, like CART, for example, 
allows the use of prior probabilities to sweep the, 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 the basically equalize classes or do all sorts of other corrections. In your view, how does your algorithm compare to those classical approaches that effectively implicitly set different thresholds and stuff like that? That's an excellent question, and I think uh, they are analog analogous in a certain way because uh, what happens is you can actually uh, um, you can actually fix the threshold to uh, show to show that it's similar to these prior class distributions. Other questions? I have a question actually. So, um, how does the accuracy of the model depend uh, with alpha? So as I said, uh, it depends. It depends upon which classifier you're using. For example, in linear classification, we could theoretically show the 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 dependence on alpha, and we showed that the best alpha that you have basically is prop is dependent upon the class uh, distribution, the ratio of the classes. For uh, nonlinear trees, we've just done an empirical evaluation. We don't have a theoretical guarantee yet. Any intuition on how it would do with like financial fraud that might be one in 10,000 or clicking on a banner ad that might be one in 10,000, just much more imbalanced? Uh, that's an excellent question, and uh, that's one of the scenarios that, uh, so when I'm talking about scrap, and I spoke about scrap from 6 to 16 percent, there are also scenarios where we had scrap like 0.5 percent, and we tried to use these methods. At times, they gave us good results, but there's no golden recipe that we are aware as of now. All right, one last question. So in your research, did you actually find some algorithm like random forest or logistic regression uh, actually quite robust to the imbalanced data set? Uh, so just for some algorithm like SVM, which is, why, is, which is very sensitive to the imbalanced data set. Right. But for the others, it just use all the data you can use. Yeah, so we tried random forest and we thought that these decision trees, the ARDT based trees, they gave us better results. If you, it's basically a splitting criterion, right? So you can also apply it for random forest. As I said, one of the important factors that we had to take under consideration was the interpretability part of it and it was more difficult to express a random forest to a person in a manufacturing line as compared to a decision tree. Therefore, we focus mostly on decision trees. Okay, one, if anyone has any quick comments, questions? No? Oh, over there. What, what's sort of the, the ballpark, um, you mentioned one in 10,000 for class imbalance. Right. What, what could the so we had taken around, so our could, scrap. Could you repeat the question? Okay, so I think uh, the question was, what was the ballpark of the class imbalance that we have worked with? So uh, the one that we had worked with was 0.5% of scrap and 99.5% good parts. But of course, it's not one in 1,000, so I don't really know the answer to that. Hey, uh, yeah, nice talk. Uh, I had a question. How does this compare to other like classical approaches of uh, dealing with class balance, like downsampling, you know, when you're training and our synthetic minor, minority yeah. or sampling? Uh, so yeah. we did, uh, in our paper, we do speak about downsampling uh, and oversampling, undersampling and oversampling, and we can show that you can actually, uh, so as we said, it's a concept of thresholding, and you can theoretically show that when you're undersampling or oversampling, you're basically changing the threshold. So it is related. Yes, it is related. Okay, thank you, Rumi, again for the wonderful talk. And. Uh,